Share slide. Share screen. I don't listen to Ben anymore. <laughs> got no choice in my hour. Got no choice, dude. Got no choice. Captain, how you feeling? Yeah, you're tired. Well, it's Literally, I work. You're working on the COVID unit? Well, it's not really like a COVID unit. It's just like they keep like quarantining the house and I'm like, oh, we're going to go after like it was basically like, over and over talking about it anymore, so I, it was funny because like from the beginning like I was in it, like testing everybody and I kept thinking I had it in my just you know like set hard away so and I think it was like I was like we were using so many alcohol so just and I was like why am I taking my insurance I don't know you get it oh it's like three I'm like eating Green Jolly Ranch is a little wonky. Let me straight feel the weird one day. Like, it's just like, um, it, I don't think it's like half alcohol, but maybe it's like coloring or something. I don't know. There's something in it. It's like good boys. It's all good. Are you sniffling? Uh, just a little bit. No. I'm good. Oh, I'm good. No, I'm good. Yeah. Shannon, yeah. <laughs> you good? All right. Chat, good to see you. How are you doing? All right, let's dive into this. Let's begin with the prayer. And uh, we'll get started here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful day. We understand, Father, and know that uh, you created all things by speaking everything into existence. Uh, we are so thankful to be able to, to know who you are and to seek after you, as Paul talked about in Acts chapter 17. We pray, Father, that we will continue to seek first uh, your kingdom and your righteousness and help us, dear Heavenly Father, to appreciate the holy scriptures that have been preserved for us. We pray, God, that you'll bless us and be with us today. There are some who are sick, and we are putting our trust in you, Father, to restore them. Your will be done. And we're so thankful, Father, for um, the prayers that you have answered so many times for us. We're so thankful, Father, for the great confidence and faith that we can have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's turn over to 1 Kings chapter 8. We're going to be talking about, what's up, bro? 1 Kings chapter 8. We're going to be talking about the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, the indwelling of the Spirit um, shortly here as well. Uh, we're on page number 13, so we're going to keep moving forward. <laughs> One quick thought or something I want to remind you of. Uh, Miles and I have started a new podcast it's called After the Amen Podcast, and it's designed really for the members here. Also, for people, you know, anywhere in the world, what we're going to do, uh, it's going to be released, a new episode is going to be released every Tuesday, and we're basically going to review the sermon from this, you know, from every Sunday, and if there are questions that you have, uh, let me know Sunday or Monday, and we're going to record on Mondays, uh, so you can let me know or Miles know, but it's going to give us an opportunity, 20, 25 minutes tops, to uh, maybe dive into a particular thought a little bit more from that sermon. So it's designed to just give us something else as we go through the week. So Stephen S. is one of our elders, sends out some kind of uh, biblical thought, typically every Monday from different uh, uh, brethren. Uh, so now you're going to have this on Tuesday. You're going to have a uh, Bible class on Wednesday. So there's opportunity to continue to, to listen to God's word, to study a little bit more. Um, it can happen fairly easily, where by seven days or the following week, you kind of forget about what was the sermon about? Uh, what were those three points? Uh, or five, typically I don't have five, but what were those three points, right? So this is something for you just to stay connected. And today I'm going to be talking about ancient words, uh, one of my new favorite songs. We're going to be learning some new songs, Lord, at five o'clock. I want to encourage you to come back to that. Uh, that's been a challenge for me, and it's something I'm working on, so it's, it's no longer going to be 
as much of the challenge, but singing more, um, singing more, not just on Sundays. Um, I can sing here with everybody. Um, we sang pretty great last night at the Devo. I felt that way. Um, and uh, I don't know about you. You were behind me, so you probably heard my voice a little bit more. Yeah, did it? It didn't taint anything, huh? <laughs> I mean, it's teenage boys singing. <laughs> it, was right. good. it was good. All right, good. All right, good. So anyway, after the Amen podcast, uh, look it up, listen to it. And if you have questions about the sermon each week, then uh, another opportunity to uh, look at that. Okay, First Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8, we find King Solomon. Solomon has built the temple of the Lord. Uh, the Lord had appeared to Solomon. He's going to appear to him twice. And when we think about the uh, Holy Spirit and this idea of dwelling, uh, the Bible makes it clear that the Spirit dwells within us. And I want to use this as a launching pad, and we'll get into it a little bit more. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we find this dedication that Solomon is giving to, to God. In 1 Kings 8, verse number 10, it happened that when the priests came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord. <laughs> So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick cloud. I have surely built you a lofty house, a place for your dwelling forever. So Solomon says, this house is for the Lord. It is a dwelling place for the Lord forever. In verse 23, he said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. And he goes on in verse 26. Now, therefore, O God of Israel, let your word, I pray, be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant, my father, David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. So how do we understand this? Uh, Solomon says that he's built this house, and it is a dwelling place for the Lord forever. But then in verse number 27, I, I want to hear from you. He says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house I have built. Yet, look at verse 28. Regard to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which your servant prays before you today, that your eyes may be open toward this house night and day, toward the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray toward this place. Listen to the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place here in heaven, your dwelling place, hear and forgive. Let's talk, let's talk about that for just a couple of minutes. He says the house is the dwelling place of the Lord. But where does he say God is dwelling? This is where you tell me. What is it? Heaven, right? That's what the text says. So how do we reconcile this? He says, this house is your dwelling place forever. But then he says, well, we know that heaven is your dwelling place. Thoughts. Let's talk. Let's struggle together. Chuck, you're smiling. Your mind is moving this morning. You're fully caffeinated. Uh, you drink caffeine? I uh, know. Oh, you're not fully caffeinated. Okay. <laughs> so this may be even more fun. Um, tell me, what are you thinking about this? I I think about when you use the term an omnipresence, you know, that God's everywhere, you know, in, in that in that sense. I mean, it's something we can say that word and say and define that word. And yeah. It's hard to, I don't know, as humans, you can't get our, our minds fully wrapped around that, right? Yeah. You know, he can dwell there, but he can also be in heaven, you know, and, okay. and that, I guess that's what I mean. Okay, so some thoughts about the omnipresence of God. What else, Tony? I think, too, like, there's um, like, like there's a it's not replication, but there's a there's an emblem that represents where God is. And that's kind of how it was for the people. So with the temple, 
um, you know, he was present in the synagogues. He's present here when we talk about him dwelling with us now. Well, is God's spirit dwelling in a physical body? No, <laughs> but it's like a representation of his eternalness, I guess. Okay. So they, they built places like that that were specific for him, dedicated to him, to sacrifice to him, honor him. But his physical presence was in heaven. Okay. Uh, yeah. Verse 11 says, the glory of the Lord built the heavens. Okay. What's the significance of that? Not that he was there, okay, but his glory was there. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Good. For the same reasons. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anyone else? It sounds, sounds like it's a place he's going to pray. So he hopes God is there hearing. Yeah. So there's some sense of God seeing yeah. and hearing. That's exactly right. Yeah. What else? You guys see anything else, please? Kind of the place where God is choosing to allow people yeah. to come to him. Kind of like um, the ark or the mercy seat was the holy. It was like this. No, he wasn't there because we know he's in heaven, but yeah. he told them he was and like you touch it, you know. Right. You know, like it's this is where I am, this is holy. Yeah. And it's got that significance. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, we can't be in the presence at this time, they were both dead, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, he's like, This is where I'm telling you that I am, you know, sure. don't don't, you know, as before it was like you can't approach the the ark, you can't touch it, you know, right. this I'm here as well. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's enough for us. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Excellent thoughts. Yeah, please. Well, on that point, like from from the Ark of the Covenant to to the Tabernacle to now the Temple, right? That that God has always made a place for worship, and and to me, I like this this verse to to where the song "I Need Thee" every hour. Like Solomon saying, God, I need you, and I need you to hear me, and I need you to be with us. And people have a desire to to be with God, right, and to worship Him. And that's to me, that's where what this is getting to is that um, a bit like like was said that we can't wrap our, our heads around the omnipresence, we can't wrap our, our minds around eternity, right? But for man's minds to to have a place to go and worship. Yeah, that, that they have that representation of God being there. Yeah, yeah, excellent, good. Yeah, and you think about the tabernacle, then you think about the temple of God here in First Kings chapter eight. What other temple do we read about in the New Testament? Us, the, us, yeah, the body is the temple, the church, First Corinthians chapter three, right? So I wanted just to share this because I think it helps me out as I think about the the indwelling of the Spirit. And sometimes we can kind of attach things to the Holy Spirit that we don't do with the Father or with the Son. Remember the throne scene in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5? Where is God? Well, he's in heaven. That's why we have this throne scene, right? Where did Jesus? Where is Jesus right now? He is in heaven at the right hand of God. And yet he would tell his apostles, and lo, I'm with you always even until the end of the age but he wasn't there you know physically right next to them but he was with them and so i think that helps me and hopefully that'll help us with understanding the holy spirit as well so when you think about this idea of dwelling solomon did not get it wrong he didn't get it wrong with well he isn't dwelling he is dwelling in the temple that's what he said he's dwelling in the temple and i believe he shows us how with respect to his presence, and I think this is pointing to relationship. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, you know, think about that. And since we've been in this class, just think about it. one thing about the apostles: how much stronger they were. Yes, he physically wasn't with them. Yeah, and how weak they were when he physically was. Yes, that's exactly stronger. right. Yeah, they got they actually got stronger, and you know that's a great point too. It was because of the resurrection. Right. And that's where everything changed. And so sometimes people say, well, once they receive the Holy Spirit baptism, that's when everything changed. And certainly maybe so. But no, once they knew that he was alive after he had died, they're hiding behind closed doors in John chapter 20. Right. Thomas is saying, unless I touch him, I will not believe um, that he is alive. And so they have, that's a great point where they actually become even more bold and courageous post resurrection. When Jesus is actually back in heaven, that's a, that's an excellent point. So here in First Kings chapter eight, thank you everyone for sharing. I think these are excellent thoughts to get the class started here. 
<laughs> when when Solomon speaks about dwelling, Solomon had no problem understanding that indeed God ultimately dwells in heaven, uh, but his presence was with the people. His eyes or upon them. So he sees what they're going through. His ears were attentive to their prayer. So it's, a, it's, it's pointing back to relationship. And so as we think about the spirit dwelling within us, or the father dwelling with, uh, within us, or Jesus dwelling within us by faith, it's pointing back again to this idea of relationship, of fellowship. That's a big biblical term that we read about. It's never talking about pancake dinners, car washes, things like that. But what it is talking about is relationship. And so something very important. So I want to just launch there. We'll talk a little bit more about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is maybe as complicated as it really needs to be, but there are a lot of different views. And one of the challenges that we will have, or some people will have, is trying to parcel up God, trying to parcel up God into millions and millions of pieces. And, and that's just not going to work as we understand who he is. Um, so with that, I want to talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38 is one of those studies as well that there are a lot of different uh, answers that are given with respect to the gift of the Holy Spirit. We know that this is biblical language because we read about it in Acts 2 and verse 38. Peter said to them, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you. I think it's appropriate to read verse 39. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, which would include us, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So if you did the workbook on page number 13 or the lesson, um, I wrote, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38 is the subject of controversy. Uh, there can be a variety of, of answers given. Is it the uh, power to perform miracles? My answer to that is no, it's not power to perform miracles. But that's an answer that sometimes people believe is true. Is it a literal indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Well, my answer to that is no as well. And I think First Kings chapter 8, and looking at how other passages talk about how God dwells within us is important as well. So when I say a literal indwelling, you know, where, where the Holy Spirit is literally inside um, our body. Um, is it the promised gift of salvation? Well, I think this is heading more in the right track. And I think there's more that we can talk about here um, as well. Um, is it synonymous with the promise of the Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I've done some reading on that as well. So let's talk a little bit about this. The way that I set up the lesson, I wanted first to just show you that this idea of the gift is used in a couple of different ways throughout the Bible. Um, and he, I think you mentioned it last week, like 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talked about the gift that he had. And so I was thinking about this lesson when you mentioned that verse, because we see different ways that this uh, pass or phrase is used, the gift. One is in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse number 13. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse number 13. Look over here. We'll, we'll go through this kind of quickly here. Um, verse 13, moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It is the gift of God. So when Solomon says it is the gift of God, what is this gift that he's talking about? joy yeah the blessings that come from the labor that we have is the gift of god god literally inside of us no that's not what he's talking about the context doesn't demand that right so the gift here is the joy from the labor um, that we have look over in john 4 we see this language the gift or gift again in john chapter 4 and verse number 10 this is where jesus was speaking to the samaritan woman remember that and uh, he's going to help this woman understand that he is the Messiah. Remember what Jesus said in John 4, verse number 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What is the gift of God here? Is it God literally inside 
dwelling inside her body. What's the gift of God, Bethel? What'd you say? I said, let me look at it again. Okay. So like salvation? That's exactly right. What God provides, that is the gift of God. Does that make sense? So we see this language uh, in Romans 6, verse 23. Look over there. Romans 6. Now, Paul is writing to Christians, all right? And these are obviously believers. They obey the gospel. Romans 6 is often left out in the Roman road of salvation. This is something that different denominations teach. Um, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, if you believe in Jesus Christ, like from Romans 10, and confess, uh, you will be saved. But they forget about Romans chapter 6. They forget about what the Bible teaches concerning baptism. Um, that's just a little sidebar. Verse 23, we see this language of gift in God again. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what's the gift here? Well, it's not God himself literally, right? But it's what he is providing. You guys see that? And what is it that he's providing? He's providing eternal life. Does that make sense? So I just want you to walk through. Let's read again 1 Corinthians chapter 7, because we see this language of gift. And I understand and recognize that, yes, these are other passages, but I do think it is important to understand just how this language is used. And our first thought should not automatically be, well, it's a literal indwelling of, of God or literal indwelling of Jesus or a literal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7, Paul is talking about marriage. And he says in verse 7, Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. So, Hugh, last week when I mentioned this, this gift that I think Paul is talking about here is referring to his singleness, singleness celibacy, um, with uh, discipline in his body and, and things like that. That's my understanding there. Um, it, 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 speaking about miraculous powers here wouldn't seem to fit the context either with what he's talking about, okay? Um, so that's my understanding that he's talking about abstinence here uh, with respect to himself. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, please. Paul here is talking about the sin that we used to be a part of or be in, what God has done delivering us from this sin. And in Ephesians 2, verse number 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So what is the gift? Is it God himself or what he is providing? It's what he's providing. Does that make sense? All right. Now, why is this important? Well, when we go back to Acts chapter 2, and we'll get there in a moment, um, I think this will help us out. In Acts 2, verse 38, the common thought immediately is to say, well, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit himself literally dwelling within our bodies. And if we understand that God dwells in heaven, that is his dwelling place. Uh, then I think we're going to run into some complications as we talk more about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people just put things on the Holy Spirit that they that they never do with the Father or the Son. And so we have to question, why, why do we do that um, with respect to the Holy Spirit? Now, I want to be clear. The Bible is very clear that the Spirit dwells within us. Remember, remember Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. <laughs> Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. Listen to what these verses say here. And what I did also just put a definition of what this indwelling, my understanding is. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse number 
Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? So there's never a question that the Spirit is in us, that the Spirit dwells within us. The only question is, in what way? So the text is very clear that the Spirit dwells within us. What else does the Bible say dwells within us? Can I just ask a little more clarity? Because it, clarity with respect with, to love. In respect to, so is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us? Yes, because yes. I feel like the other passages we just looked at are referencing salvation. Well, if we say that the Spirit is living in us, is the question in what way? Yes. Like, like the physical, like the literal Spirit can't dwell in a physical body, so we know this. So I guess I'm a little confused. I'm not 100% clear. Okay, let's go back to Romans chapter 8, and let's look at verse number 9. Or what does it do? So let's go back to Romans chapter 8, and verse number 9. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. So I'm reading this text, Tanya, to help us to see uh, that the Spirit of God dwells within us. So when you leave this class today at 9.50, I want to be sure you understand the Bible teaches the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. That's what the Bible says. All right? Romans 8 and verse number 9. However, you are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So my understanding is spirit of God is talking about the Holy Spirit. And he's saying the spirit of God dwells within you. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, that, okay. So that before, makes sense okay, before we, 238. Hold on. Received. Before we get back to that, though, I want to be sure for you and for everybody else, don't leave the class thinking the spirit does not dwell within us. So I'm, I'm just emphasizing this for clarity's sake. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. That's what the Bible says. Let's read again 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 19. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 19. We'll get back to Acts chapter 2 time in just a second. So thank you for sharing that because I want to be sure no one leaves here saying, Ben said the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell within us. That's not what I'm teaching. What I am teaching is the Holy Spirit dwells within us. That's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You see that? What's that teaching us? He says the Holy Spirit is in us. So does that make sense, Tanya? I want to make sure yeah, before we move on. Okay. So that that has made sense. I okay. My my confusion is on the one hand we're saying I thought I heard you say the spirit doesn't dwell in us, and or maybe it's the literal sense. Because yeah, yeah. So let me mindset. Yeah. Yeah. We were given that gift. Okay, so let me stop there to make sure you're clear and everyone else. What I am saying, the Holy Spirit dwells with us. Okay. Okay. Now, the second part to that question is how okay. the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The question now becomes how. Now, look at Romans 8, and I'll answer some questions here in just a second. In Romans chapter 8, because I don't want anyone leaving here um, saying, well, the Holy Spirit does not dwell in us. It does. It's what the Bible teaches. The question is always how. Look at Romans uh, chapter 8 and verse number 10. If Christ is in you, so he's saying Christ should be in us. Do we all agree with that? So who is in us? The Spirit is said to be in us. Who else is said to be in us? Christ. Well, wait a second. Where's Christ? Where's Christ? I heard like some, some murmur. Where's Christ? He's in heaven. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. So I think this is going to help us out with understanding how does the Spirit dwell within us. So the Bible is clear. The Spirit is in us. Christ is in us. Before we leave chapter 8, okay. could I make a comment? I hope it doesn't confuse anything, but it helps me. Okay, please. If we back up to verse 8, mm -hmm. 
here is those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay. You, however, are not in the flesh, but we are in the flesh. <laughs> so right. it can't be yes. a physical indwelling. Mm -hmm. It can't be a controlling part. Or uh, yeah, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. No, go ahead. So no. it, it's got to mean something else. Now, when you say controlling part, what do you mean? Well, it, it's not some miraculous thing that takes over. Oh, our, I see what you're saying. Our actions, because yes. we are in the flesh. That's exactly right. Yeah. And he's saying, well, you're not in the flesh. Right. So it's got to be something different. Yes. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great observation. That's exactly right. So it's not the spirit controlling our every uh, move, uh, things like that, right? Where we have no free will or anything like that. It certainly is not talking about miraculous powers. That's my understanding. It's not talking about miraculous powers. Um, that's exactly right. Um, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So I, I'm driving this home for a reason. The spirit, the Bible says, is in us. The son, the Bible says, is in us. Well, we might as well go three for three. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse number 16. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse number 16. Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. So he says, I will dwell in them. So the Father dwells within us. The Son dwells within us. The Spirit dwells within us. He's actually quoting from, I believe, uh, Exodus chapter 29. I will dwell in them, walk among them, and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, uh, and do not touch what is unclean. So, uh, yeah, this is good because I want you to understand that the Bible teaches the Holy Spirit dwells within us, the Son is to be in us, and the Father um, as well. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. One more text just for emphasis sake. This is Paul speaking, and he's writing to the churches of Galatia in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. <coughs> he says in Galatians 2 and verse number 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. How did Christ live in Paul? And how does Christ live in us? Through faith. Through faith. That's exactly right. Through faith. So if Christ lives in us, and the Spirit lives in us, and the Father lives in us, it's going to be through faith. That's going. To, that's my understanding. So it is very clear, hopefully, that the Bible teaches the Spirit dwells within us. All right? So everybody, make sure we're on the same page. If we're not, we can talk more. The question is always how. This is really where the debate really has been. And confusion, because... If we start assuming the Spirit is going to be doing some things for us that he has never said he's going to do, like make everything perfect in our lives, every perfect decision, every opportunity just opens up, miraculous powers, I'm going to hear him in a dream or a vision because he lives in me. Well, now we're, this is where the turbulence and chaos and the false teaching can creep in, okay? But it is clear, I want to be clear, that um, that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we find that language of them living within us. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17. You actually see this language of dwelling as well. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 17. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 17. So we've seen this idea of dwelling, um, living, and uh, in Ephesians 3 and verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love. So Christ dwells in our hearts. So if someone says, does Christ dwell in you? What's your answer? 
Only heard 53 people. Yes. Yes, that's a biblical answer. We're not going Pentecostal or anything like that. This is a biblical answer. We get afraid, though, sometimes. So Christ uh, dwells within us. The question is always how. He dwells within us through faith. That's very important to understand. Christ dwells within us through faith. So I, I'm saying this because Pentecostalism, remember our very first lesson? Pentecostalism began in 1901, and it began with individuals saying that they were able to speak in tongues, and it began with false understanding of the Holy Scriptures, of what they believed to be true. Okay, let's look at all the passages, uh, looking at speaking in tongues, and it began in Kansas at a college there, and it has just continued to grow, so much so that I keep hearing from Christians sometimes I, I never really had a class on the Holy Spirit. We don't talk about the Holy Spirit. Or can we have more sermons pertaining to the Holy Spirit? So I'm saying that not to be rude or anything like that, but just to understand that I, I should be comfortable, and so should you, to say that Christ dwells in our hearts. That's what the Bible teaches. Go ahead. Yeah, it just this a question. Um, um, in the Old Testament, how do you God dwell in? In these temples, is it a physical? Or yeah, yeah, we talked about that right at the beginning of class. Uh, first Kings chapter 8, we oh. talked about Solomon when he dedicated the temple. He said, Here, O God, is your dwelling place. And then he said, We know that nothing on earth can contain you because your dwelling place is in heaven. But he dwelled with them in the sense of his presence, of his glory of his ears being attentive to their prayers, of his eyes being open to them, of them knowing that, yes, this that we have this fellowship or relationship with God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, Go ahead. Thinking about that, our temple today, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking about how God brought us. And mm -hmm. Can we look at the, can we have, that can help us a bit to understand. Oh, yeah. absolutely. That so it's not yes, it's not a literal dwelling of God Himself. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And and that's why I'm actually going through this because that's what I want us to see that we have fellowship with the Godhead, uh, that we have fellowship, uh, this relationship. Remember first Peter chapter three, I believe, right? The Lord's ears are attentive to our cries. Um, and we have this kind of language, John chapter 15, remember in John chapter 15, J Jesus is talking to his apostles in John chapter 15 and verse number four, John chapter 15 and verse number four. So not only does Jesus dwell within us, not only is Jesus in us, along with the Holy Spirit and the Father, but we're supposed to be in Jesus. How does that work? How can all of us be in Jesus? All right, look at John 15, verse number four. Abide in me, Jesus says, and I in you. You see that? Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. All right? I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me. So look how many times he's saying abide. Verse 4, verse 5, verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So someone help me out. How do we abide in Christ? You? It's a mutual dwelling. It is a mutual dwelling. That's exactly right. It's a mutual dwelling. <laughs> a mutual dwelling. Does that make sense? It's conditional, too, because we can decide no longer to abide in Jesus. Does that make sense? So any questions with this? Tanya, I know you started it. This is great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm reemphasizing this for a reason. The Bible teaches the Spirit dwells within us, the Son dwells within us, the Father, 
And now we see we can abide with him as well. Not not only can we, but we're supposed to. Krista. Just to make sure that I am on um, the I'm before my own Okay. So um, I'm thinking, because earlier when I came in, we were talking about how we like to just compartmentalize um, God in all these different things. And I'm thinking this is where that comes in again. Here yeah, we want to put God in this box. Oh, he really lives in me. But we say to like people, you know, I see a lot of your mom in you. Yes. And we know that's not their mom in them. Yeah, that's good. But we see the tendencies, the characteristics, the personality of somebody else. Yes. So what my understanding, I want to make sure that I'm clear when I'm right. So if I'm talking to somebody, sure. when I become a Christian, I have chosen to give up my life. Mm -hmm. Galatians 2 20. And accept Christ and the way he wants me to live. That's right. So therefore you're going to start seeing a lot of Godly tendencies in me. That's right. That's right. Because God is in me. The Holy Spirit is in me. That's Christ exactly right. Me. Yeah, that's exactly right. Class, you guys agree? That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's exact that's a great illustration. And that's excellent. Any other questions? That's good. That's really good. We sing a lot of songs. Please. Yes, Christ liveth in me. <laughs> Abide with me. Yes, yes. You know, we sing these songs. We may not understand them. <laughs> point. Ah, point. Not, we're not supposed to be singing. You don't understand. We're understanding what we're singing. We're supposed to sing with understanding. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's a great point to you. Yeah, and I will uh, say this on one second. I think this is why, you know, last year we did a class on the Holy Spirit. But it came up again on the survey. So this is why we're doing it again this year. I'd like to teach this again next year. I, I'm not going to finish the book. <laughs> I'd like for you to teach it two quarters. Yes, that's what I need, actually. I need two quarters. I really do. Um, uh, you're right, though, on the poll as well, right? We, we have to see what the understanding. And that's a, that's a powerful point. Yeah. It's almost almost like the Godhead. <clears throat> and um, where... <clears throat> People try to understand how God is Christ and Christ is God and the Holy Spirit is God. And, but it talks about what they all, how they all have that character of Godliness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. The distinction between them and yet yeah, on God. Right. So Three and one, one God. I'm going back to that to, to just look at just almost to something like what she talks about when Christ says, You see the body and I see the you see the fire in him and the meaning of yeah. fire and all that. Mm -hmm. So it's not literally for the fire in him, mm -hmm. but you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's exactly right. And I think um, first of all, great explanation with that as well. Uh, and that, going back to Second uh, Corinthians chapter 6 um, is a great example of what this looks like. Verse 16. Second Corinthians 6 verse 16. I will dwell in them and walk among them. There's fellowship. There's relationship. I will be their God, one only God, and have no gods before me. They shall be my people. There's a commitment there. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate. There's holiness there. You see that? There's a transformation there. You no longer belong to yourself. Be holy and do not touch, Isaiah 52, I believe, what is unclean. So you see, that's what it looks like when the when God lives in me, or Christ liveth in me, or abide in me. Excellent study, guys. This is fantastic. Um, I hope this has helped you. Uh, this is a great walkthrough. Uh, I need to listen to this again and make some modifications to the to the workbook, add some of these thoughts. So let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Um, we've got about five minutes left, but let's see what we can um, take away from Acts chapter 2. Excellent study. All right. <clears throat> All right, so we've already talked about the gift of God. <clears throat> All right, so we've already looked at those verses. I forgot about Romans 5, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 6. Oh, I forgot about Romans 7, verse 20. This is a great passage, too. I should have looked at my slides. All right, go back to Romans 7. Hit the pause on Acts 2. Uh, we got to get through. Romans 7 and verse 20. You know what? I meant to do this before looking at Romans 8, because I think it gives a little bit more clarity. Look at Romans 7 and verse 20. 
Paul says, but if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin, which dwells in me. Ah, how does sin dwell within us? Who are in the flesh? Three one. <laughs> yeah, we are in the flesh. But isn't that interesting? All these things that can dwell within us. So that helps me understanding, okay, well, sin can dwell in me, but not when the spirit's dwelling within me, right? You see that there's a contrast, really, from chapter 7 and chapter 8. I forgot about that. All right, so uh, here's a good working definition that, that I like, and you guys have already said some great things as well. The spirit dwells in us when we allow the word of God to rule our lives. The spirit of God dwells in us when we submit our lives to the rule of Jesus Christ. This is not something mystical in nature. I'm not saying that the Bible is the Holy Spirit either. I'm not saying that, right? It's what the Spirit has given. So the Spirit dwells in us when we allow the Word of God to rule our lives. The Spirit of God dwells in us when we submit our lives to the rule of Jesus Christ. What do you think about that definition? And that's in the workbook as well. All right. Excellent study. So let's look at Acts 2 and verse 38. Acts 2 and verse number 38. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's turn over to Acts 3 and verse 19. I believe Acts 3 and verse 19 is synonymous with what Peter is saying in Acts 2, verse 38. Peter's not going to change his message in a short amount of time to teach something different. What he does say in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, Therefore, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. What Peter is emphasizing, this idea of times of refreshing, this gift of the Holy Spirit, I walked us through all those passages that use this language of gift in God to show that it's God who is providing some kind of gift. I think that's what's taking place here. My understanding, the way that I have taught this, is that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the promised gift of salvation. It was the Holy Spirit who spoke through the prophets of old, it was the Holy Spirit who foretold um, salvation through the Messiah. And as I study this more, I have added a couple of additional thoughts of this idea of the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has had talked about quite a few things. The restoration of the kingdom, this covenant, new covenant being established. And as I study more, uh, I, I'm thinking that this gift of the Holy Spirit is really emphasizing something a lot more comprehensive. Yes, it entails salvation because that's what the Spirit foretold. How do we know that from the context of Acts chapter 2? How do we know that the Spirit had spoken about salvation in the Old Testament, pop quiz, from Acts chapter 2? You give me a verse. How do we know that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was speaking about salvation? What verse is it in Acts chapter 2? 17. Okay, verse 17, it shall be in the last days that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. So he, Joel chapter 2, remember verse 21? It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the Holy Spirit was already talking about salvation. So this gift, remember the gift of God, like in John 4, it's what God provided. Romans 6, what God provides. I think it's uh, leading us or, or taking us down that path of this promised gift of salvation. Now, there's a lot of other things that that entails. There's things that are connected to that. Um, questions about that before I show you any more with respect to the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, when one is saved from their sins, what else is taking place? When one is saved or delivered from their sins, what else is taking place? Well, you receive the gift, which is the, the gift of salvation, but you also now have fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're transferred into the kingdom of God. 
you're now a part of which covenant? A new covenant, right? In Christ. So all of these things are happening when we are saved from our sins. And, and so that's why I'm saying I think it's a more comprehensive thought. Maybe I have come short on this in times past. I think I have. When we obey the gospel, we obtain forgiveness of sins. I was talking to, to Bruce Reeves and um, just a little bit about this, and I liked what he was saying, which is a means of salvation. The fact that our sins have been forgiven, we now have this opportunity you know, to be saved, um, which is a means of salvation. As Hugh just mentioned, we are transferred into the kingdom of God, Colossians chapter 1. We have fellowship, as Nicole just mentioned, with the Godhead. And we're part of a new covenant. So I think all of these things are happening when we turn away from our sins, when we are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Sometimes we just use a lot of shortcut language. There's a lot that God is doing. He's at work in baptism, Colossians chapter 2, wiping away our sins. We have these times of refreshing. He is adding us to his kingdom. We now are part of this new covenant with superior promises and fellowship with God. And that would entail the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, along with the Son and the Father. Does that make sense? So that's my understanding of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember, in the Old Testament, we talked a little bit about this, this idea of this restoration of things, the kingdom, the covenant, uh, blessings um, that, that were coming because of what God was doing. So we'll stop here. Lord willing, I'll talk to the elders tomorrow to see if I can teach this next year. Because uh, we're prepping for Bible class. I'm serious. We're prepping for Bible class next year. Um, if you guys think, you think it would be worthwhile teaching it again? I, I think it would be. Uh, so next week, what do you say? Two quarters? Yeah. Next week, look at lesson number 15. And you can look at lesson 16 if you like as well. And we'll, I'll stop. If you guys have any questions, we can come back to this next week. Guys, I really appreciate the study. This is fantastic. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your participation. Uh, this is what Bible class is uh, all about. All right. Thank you very much. We'll stop here. Oh, boy. I don't think I started it. Oh boy, I'm in trouble. You know, it started. I, don't, I thought I, I did. I, I saw you do much. I, I, I saw you did this stuff like man. You did it, but I, maybe I didn't do it. I was. No wait, I did do it. I did do it. Paul writes here. Okay, I did.